The ATF ruled to define whether or not you get to go to prison because you wanted to sell a couple of guns has just been enjoined, but only for folks in a handful of states and possibly members of organizations. We're going to go through the whole thing, but keep in mind some of the crazy things that they're trying to get through. I'm going to be covering the video towards the end. So not trying to bait the hook for you, but I guess I am. The biggest thing, though, is that we have to work through it chronologically so you understand those points. So, guys, let's get into it. All right, so first, for some background, all this fundamentally deals with the 1968 Gun Control Act. That basically allowed the U.S. Attorney General's office to enforce gun control laws. Now, that enforcement was delegated to the agency that eventually turned into the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, better known henceforth as the ATF. Quick refresher in the law. You can sell guns without a dealer license under federal law. Check your local listings for your particular state. However, if you are engaged in the business of selling guns, then you cannot. If you are in the business and you are selling guns without a federal firearms license, then you're facing a felony with up to five years in prison and a fine of up to $250,000. There could also be state and local consequences if you run afoul of those as well, so be sure to check your local listings. So that was the 1968 Gun Control Act. Then in 1986, we had the Firearm Owners Protection Act that actually, you know, provided a useful definition from Congress to helpfully test whether or not you are actually in the business of selling firearms. So before they just talked about being in the business of firearms, but now in 1986, we have a definition. This definition would be subsequently updated in 2022 under the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And that's the point of analysis where the ATF's rule comes in. So the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act eliminated the requirements from the Firearm Owners Protection Act. So the 2022 congressional law changed the 1986 definition that the person's principal objective of purchasing and reselling firearms must include both livelihood and profit and simply replace the livelihood and profit with a requirement to, quote, predominantly earn a profit. So love it or hate it, that's where it is. And I'm not offering any commentary on that. This is just exposition. This is just background. However, and very importantly, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act provided a safe harbor provision to exclude people from prosecution if a person who makes an occasional sale, exchanges or purchases of firearms for the enhancement of a personal collection or for a hobby, or who sells all or part of his personal collection of firearms. So if you're one of those, enhancement of personal collection or for hobby, or you're selling part of your personal collection of firearms, that's the safe harbor provision that's going to exclude you from prosecution. Or will it? Stick that in the back of your head. We're going to come back to that later. But now enter the ATF, who on April 19th of 2024 passed a final rule to, of course, as they say, provide clarity to persons who remain unsure of whether they are engaged in the business as a firearm dealer with the predominant intent of obtaining a pecuniary gain, their words, not mine. Pecuniary gain from the Latin pecunia, thank you 11th grade Latin class, that basically means money. So for those of you trying to reap a financial gain or turn a profit, that's where the ATF might be able to pick you off. Quote, agencies as mere creatures of statute must point to explicit congressional authority justifying their actions, end quote. That is not Tom Greaves saying that. That comes from a federal circuit court of appeals. And keep in mind, that's important because the ATF is not Congress. As much as some of the people there may like to think of themselves as Congress, they are not Congress. They are agencies with delegated authority. The ATF cannot just pass a clarifying rule that exceeds the limit of the law set by Congress nor can they make an unreasonable interpretation of where Congress wanted this strike zone set. If Congress was silent, or if they left a gap or a hole in the language that they passed, then ATF can make reasonable interpretations based on the text of the law that is consistent with the other lines. They cannot exceed those lines. That's a low resolution version of what the ATF can and cannot do. Not an endorsement of that. That's an explanation of that. Guys, really quickly, be sure to hit that like button. And my question for the comment discussion below is going to deal with, is the ATF actually 
if they get their rule in place, going to be going after ordinary Joes who are just trying to sell a firearm or two. Do you think we're going to see hyper aggressive regulation or maybe are we just being overly sensitive on the pro Second Amendment side? Let me know your thoughts in the comment field below and back to the show. So according to the judge, and by the way, this judge has been a rock star on the Second Amendment, and for that matter, a lot of other issues. This is a federal district court judge based out of Texas. There are at least three ways that I'm going to quickly go through. I'm going to add a few more at the end, but I said at least three ways that the rule fails the Administrative Procedures Act and exceeds the law. And again, you're going to want to hear to the very end about how the ATF perversely may be inverting a key United States Second Amendment criminal law function. First, the rule is explicit that there is no minimum amount of firearms that have to be sold or can even be offered for sale in order to be considered to be in the business of selling firearms. So they ruled there's no minimum amount. In other words, if you buy one firearm and then turn around and sell it for an arguable profit, that could be, according to the ATF, engage in the business of selling firearms without a license, perhaps. However, if we look to what the law said under Congress, it very clearly says, quote, the repetitive purchase and resale of firearms. The judge basically throws the flag on this as being contradictory since, you know, repetitive purchase and resale of firearms certainly sounds like more than just the one that the ATF is saying that that's all it takes. That's issue number one. Second, according to the judge, has to do with this whole pecuniary gain, profit earning language under the law. So the ATF basically took what was, were they earning a profit into, do they intend to earn a profit? Now, to be clear, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act does leave a loophole whereby profit does not need to be part of the picture. If you're engaged in the regular and repetitive purchase and sale of firearms, some keywords there, for criminal purposes or terrorism. But setting aside criminal purposes or terrorism, profit needs to be part of the picture. So according to the ATF, quote, a person who repeatedly advertises and displays firearms for sale and therefore demonstrates a predominant intent to earn a profit from repeatedly reselling the firearms purchased but never actually finds a buyer could be in violation of the law. So you go from repetitive purchases and sales where profit is actually gained to, well, were you listing it at certain prices that could generate a profit? You can see how the judge throws the flag on that one. The best is yet to come. Third objection that the judge has is probably the biggest and certainly one of the ones that I kind of underline in my own mind. And again, we're getting to like my bonus fourth. And that's not to say that I don't agree, by the way, with the other two. It's simply to say that my main one would probably be this one. In no small part, it's the one that's going to land ordinary Joes like you and me in prison left, right, and sideways. This deals with the safe harbor provision found at 921 sub A, sub 21, sub C. That's the whole part that deals with, look, if you're reselling firearms for the purposes of expanding your collection and all that kind of stuff. The ATF rule would seem to arguably ignore that safe harbor provision entirely. In fact, the rule is explicit in saying, among other things, that the term personal collection shall not include firearms purchased for personal protection. So if you bought a gun for personal protection, and if you tell that to the friendly ATF agent that shows up at your door, according to the ATF rule, that is no longer part of your personal collection under the safe harbor provisions. So you have to be explicit that you bought something for the purposes of collecting and not for personal protection, according to the ATF. Can you believe that? Now, keep in mind, as part of this lawsuit, the ATF even admitted the fact that about two thirds of Americans who own guns report owning those firearms primarily for defense or protection, according to the ATF. And they're also noted in the written decision on page 17 of the case found in the description box below. Meaning that the ATF is explicitly acknowledging that the overall majority of American gun owners will not fit the safe harbor protection. Now, I'm not gonna go so far as to say that the ATF wants to put every gun owner in prison or anything like that. I know the comment section is gonna do that anyways. And I'm not trying to call ball or strike on that notion. But I'm simply saying that if you make the word slip and say, sure, yeah, I bought that for you know personal protection then arguably you no longer fit the definition. In other words, if I purchase a gun today, Glock 19, 
and I go to sell it five years from now, right? Only once. And if I advertise it at a higher cost than what I paid for it, I may now be engaged in the business of selling firearms and it will not fit the safe harbor protection. That's the bottom line on this. That's how Joes like you and me can go to prison on this left, right, and sideways under the ATF rule of how they're trying to change things. But I tease kind of the bonus point. Here it is. This was something that I was really wondering about from the get-go on this rule back when we saw it in drafts and eventually it got published back in April. And the judge, love it, picked it up and slammed it home on page 18. I think arguably the most insidious thing about this ATF rule is that if you're listing a firearm, then you're arguably guilty until proven innocent. Because after all, do you have to show what you bought it for? If you're listing it above dealer prices or if you're listing it above MSRP prices, because maybe the market changes, maybe you're in a bubble or something like that, are you now guilty until proven innocent? Show me the receipt of what you paid for it, I can imagine an agent asking. Also, how do they know whether or not this is part of, of course, a personal collection or if you bought it for something absurd like self-defense? Now, obviously, as a defense attorney, I would argue the opposite in court, but you can see how these sorts of interpretations, seemingly these loopholes that have been thrown wide open by some of these arguments, could be used to justify warrants, arrests, investigations, you name it. So bringing this all home, accordingly, the judge ordered that the rule is enjoined while the lawsuit continues. In other words, the rule isn't done. It's simply put on pause. And this rule will probably be appealed up to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has been very gun friendly. Now, a number of plaintiffs are protected here. It's not just everybody. It's only certain plaintiffs, including the states of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Utah. There's an individual, and I suspect if you're that individual, you'd already know if you're protected. I really hope. And then there's a handful of different organizations, fantastic organizations that I strongly urge you all to support. Gun Owners of America, GOA, always love seeing them, always love talking about them. The Gun Owners Foundation, the Tennessee Firearms Association, as well as the Virginia Citizens Defense League, who I actually had the pleasure of sitting down on their YouTube channel just this past weekend. Of course, be sure to check out their channel. Uh, I did arrive, unfortunately, late. I got Eastern Time... Yeah, it's it was an embarrassing thing, but you got to come in about halfway if you want to see me on their their monthly channel podcast. Now, I know what you're going to be asking me if I'm a member of Gun Owners of America or one of these other organizations. Does that mean that I'm protected? My official answer is definitely maybe. Really, you should be asking the counsel of those organizations. I think you can argue it either way. Unfortunately, the judge was not explicit as to whether or not the injunction was basically at the entity level or at the membership level, I think you can argue that both ways. So be sure to check out the Twitter feeds and reach out to those organizations if you are a member. Ditto for the question of, well, if I wasn't a member at the time that the order came out, can I join now and gain protection? Reach out to, for instance, Gun Owners of America or one of these other fine organizations to see whether or not you could be protected. If you made it this far, don't forget to hit that like button. And of course, you're going to get rewarded with our ever popular quote of the day. This one comes from Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, one of my personal favorites, who said, if someone can prove me wrong and show me my mistake in any thought or action, I shall gladly change. I seek the truth, which never harmed anyone. The harm is to persist in one's own self-deception and ignorance. Always great seeing our friend Marcus Aurelius. And it's always great seeing all of you. I appreciate you making it this far. Look forward to reading the comments after the video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content, and we'll see you in the next one.